Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. Thank you, Emily, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, as always, before we go to the guests, can you tell me something you have discovered lately at Discovery Park of America? I have been really interested in the regional history, and I discovered that nearby Real Foot Lake falls within the Mississippi Flyway. And some of the birds that use the Mississippi Flyway have been here at Discovery Park, and we've played host to them, such as Canada geese and great blue herons during the summer months. That is one of my favorite things when I get here to work early, and I see those blue heron out there, or I see the ducks running around. The other day I got here, and not only was there a blue heron, there was um, a little raccoon scurrying off. So the wildlife here is loads of fun this time of the year. My special guest today knows all about the great outdoors and the wildlife. Our guest is Preston Powell. He's the co-owner of Yukon Outfitters. Welcome, Preston. Thank you very much for having me today. Appreciate it. So you've got a really interesting story and you've got a really uh, fun business here in West Tennessee. But before we talk about that, back us up to the very beginning. Share with us your origin story. Sure. Um, well, my background um, and as a career is in product development in the sports and outdoor industry. And I uh, was part of a lot of the teams during the growth phase uh, for K2 Inc., uh, the ski and snow. And when they started adding a lot of other outdoor brands, Rawlings Baseball, Worth Softball. Um, And then woke up one morning, was living in Asia, uh, living just a very unassuming, happy expat life. And we found we were all made redundant after the sale of that company. So I figured, okay, well, let's just, um, I'm going to take a trip. You know, I've been working hard. um, And so ended up, that trip was a fly fishing trip to the Yukon, the Yukon Territory in Canada, and what was interesting was the guide told us, hey, look, just bring yourself, your gear, and your rod. I'll take care of the rest. And I was like, well, that's great. So we get up there for different planes, one of which the last one left us there for 12 days. And then and the first day of fishing was wonderful. Um, the second through the 12th day was really bad because the, uh, Mother Nature did not cooperate. And the gear failed, and the gear and the guide failed. Uh, because the stuff he had and uh, being in that industry and a bit of a gear junkie uh, and, and being a little frustrated, I was like, man, why, why don't you have better gear? This is miserable. And he started going through about the expense related to running his business and how it has never been a problem until now. And he thought he could make it with stuff just, you know, um, that you find at, at the local hardware store. Um So instead of ripping big brown trout for 12 days, um, we started to sketch the first few pieces of the line with the goal being uh, great quality at a fair price. And after that trip, um, I knew that this is something I wanted to do was was to create a company and a brand that could fill that void in the space. Now back up a little bit for me and talk to me a little bit about Hong Kong. How, how um, had you ended up there and what, what had your background been up to that point? Absolutely. So I, was, um, I went through the international business program at Appalachian State in Boone, North Carolina, um, with the goal of playing a little bit of football and becoming a history teacher. Um, but during my time there, I had to take a, an elective outside of the College of Education, and that elective ended up being an um, intro to international business, and I was hooked. So I um, changed my, my major into business, um, and Appalachian then, and especially now, they had to have their own niche. And so Carolina had med, med school and law schools. Uh, state was a land-grant, NC State was land-grant institution uh, with ag 
And so Appalachian's niche was education and international business. And so that early on in the early 90s, they forged relationships with the with the Ivy League universities of China to begat a an exchange program in the College of Business. And um, I was fortunate enough to to win a um, a fellowship into that program. My business partner Adam, he he was in it a year later. And what was great about that program was if you wanted to, you, you, you were placed in a job overseas after graduation. So um, upon graduation, I was uh, a quality assurance associate in a footwear factory in China in uh, 2001. So that's where I cut my teeth. And um, like a lot of folks who were sent over there, then your original posting is just for 18 months, maybe two years, then they bring you back and teach you some things over here. Um, but I, I really enjoyed it and had the opportunity through um, really sports and outdoor to connect with that expat population and forge relationships that um, allowed me to stay longer and, um, and ended up staying um, 11 years. What surprised you when you got over there? What was different than what you anticipated? The biggest difference was you think that you're going to a place where no one knows English and um, there it's surprising the number of people that, um, you know, that do understand even a basic level of it. Now, that's not to say you can just only speak English. I was, uh, you know, I, I barely passed Spanish class in high school. So the submersion opportunity was something I needed to, to develop any uh, bilingual skills. But um, that is, that's what's interesting. And another thing that, that, stick, that stuck with me is if you're an American abroad, there's a different a level of responsibility because of the worldview of our country. And, and it's important to, to, to understand that, you know, you, you have to be careful how you, how you, you know, carry on in the, in the evenings, how you um, treat, you know, handle yourself in business situations. So, it's a little bit more than just, Hey, I'm, I'm going to spend some time abroad. You know, international travel was one of the reasons that Robert and Jenny Kirkland founded discovery park of America, just because they felt so strongly that travel changes lives. Did you feel that in the young executive that you were, did that in a lot of ways change the, your perceptions of the world and, and, and your, your, the, your course? A hundred percent. Um, I, I was, I was very, uh, the community I was raised in in North Carolina was very similar to the communities we have here in West Tennessee, you know, strong small town values. Um, you know, we go to church on Wednesdays and Sundays, um, but but being able to spend time abroad, especially during a, a unique place in history, you know, this is right uh, after the 9-11 terrorist attacks and America's foothold is, as far as influence in the global stage was, uh, was being reevaluated on many levels then. Um, that, that catapulted me in ways I'm still learning about in my career. Um, just having that level of, um, experience and, and really perspective that, that matters even to this day, you know, you, and, you know, being working in a, um, in a unique, uh, economic, uh, boom time, like, like Asia was in the early two thousands and mid two thousands. Um, you know, that's not withstanding that, but hundred percent, absolutely. That experience, um, uh, I used to not be a terribly t- uh, patient person as a younger man and you learn patience really quick, or especially in that environment, you'll just get chewed up and spat out really fast. So I and learned you, a lot. What, what did your uh, parents do when you were growing up for a living? Um, my father was in uh, public relations in the in, in agricultural um, uh, company. He worked for Siwagagi. Um, my mother is a real estate agent. So uh, public speaking and sales was was kind of fed to me on a, on the daily basis growing up. And how did they feel about your uh, international uh, travel? They were, um, my mom often said, uh, you know, I, I never thought my support of you studying abroad would lead to this. I never thought you would be gone for 12 years and, and we would lose you. And then, um, so they was mixed. My dad was like, you know, this is what we prepare all our children is so that they can, you know, do their own thing that they wish to do when they get out of the house. So he was more pragmatic. Um, 
but my mom, especially, uh, and then, and then I'm, when I did move back, it was in 2011, I moved back to North Carolina for a few years and then, uh, coming here to West Tennessee. So she kind of feels like she lost me twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you get homesick over there? I did. You do get homesick, but what was, what's really great about living abroad is that you form a bond with other like-minded people from your home country that are often very different from you, but you have one thing in common. That's the, you, you don't mind being put in um, chaotic situations. Um, you're able to multitask very well. So that kind of, the, the, those bonds are very strong to this day. And, and, and those of us who were, who spent time over there, um, it, it kind of galvan, galvanizes those relationships. So absolutely. At some point over there, uh, one of your bosses, as I understand it, uh, said that you, you'd shared some dreams and they said, it sounds like if you're going to make that happen, you'd have to be a man on a mission. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was over a, a, into a yearly sales, um, uh, bonus commission bonus. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I'd been working and, uh, and I didn't know that he was being very speculative in the company's finances in their real estate market in the U.S. So he, at the time, I didn't realize he didn't have it. And and we weren't talking about a, a terrible amount of money, but it was it was enough for me to get upset about, uh, especially because I was over here traveling, meeting with the retailers and whatnot. And uh, and he said, and, and he's, I said, well, if you can't pay me, I'm going to go work for myself because I'd rather be working for myself and not being paid than here. And he's like, well, if you're going to build what I built, it would take a man on a mission to create it. And um, so the next day, Moam was formed, and that's our that's our parent company. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, probably a lot of people don't even know what Moam stands for, but um, that's that's a great that's a great uh, story. Um, so Absolutely. so take us take us back to where you started sketching out the ideas were coming to you, and you know a lot of people out there have those moments where they have ideas and they start sketching and they say, "What if?" or "We should." Um, what what motivated you to take that next step to actually put those ideas? Uh, into reality? Well, uh, the biggest thing um, was keeping myself sheltered and fed. Um, But, and here's the, here's the funny thing about entrepreneurship is the idea is the easy part. It's, it's getting your product idea or service to the market. That's difficult. And, and I knew I always wanted to, to be my own boss or to, to, to create something myself, but I had to wait until I felt like I had learned enough, had studied enough, understood my market, understood my customers. And even though at 33 years old at the time, um, I barely had, you know, a few bucks to rub together. I did have those relationships with the customers. So, um, after that fishing trip, um, I came back and said, here's what I want to do. I started, you know, putting folks out, um, letting them know I did not have a non-compete. Any of you out there in sales know that, that it, you know, try to negotiate not to have one of those if you can help it. Um, but I had the fortune of someone that I had built a lot of successful programs at Exporting Goods, took a job in a new role with Amazon at the time. And he was looking for a new brand to push this very new page called Sports and Outdoors. And he he and he called me up. We were talking, and um, he had he had big visions and dreams. And my, I remember it like it was yesterday. My big question was, how can an, an e retailer that sells books sell sporting goods? Because at the time they didn't do it very well. It was very very little thing. And he's like, don't worry about it. You know, just believe. And I trusted him because we had had a a good you know equal relationship where you know he his his. Uh, his projections were often very close, and in our business, that's that's really good. And um, so he's like, "We're, we're going to build this thing." Um, and I said, "Well, I, I feel like the market needs something with hammocks and some other camping equipment because this stuff is way overpriced for what it should be." And he's like, "Great!" And he sent the the projection orders over, and and they were they were big, you know, over twenty thousand pieces on several SKUs, and that's awesome as a first as a new business. And uh, he's like, there's only one hitch. And I was like, all right, what's that? He says, um, I'm not officially going to buy them from you until we sell them the, uh, on Black Friday. And I was like, well, okay, well, 
I don't, I'm not adding. He's like, I said, he says, so the, this means you have to make the product, ship it over here, hold it and be able to ship it the very next day or the Monday after Thanksgiving. And then I started adding it up and I said, well, you're basically talking about a $700,000 gamble. And he says, that's exactly what I'm talking, but it's going to work. Don't worry. And so easy for him to say, right? Easy for him to say. <laughs> And I, and I, you know, got thinking about it and, and, and talk with, with my business partner, Adam. And, and, um, I said, well, we, I think we can do it and let's, uh, you know, I've got, uh, some artwork, some, some things I can sell is, is that I thought were important is after a decade living in Asia that had value. And then, um, um, and then we were able to, to we took the gamble and, and then at uh, midnight, nothing happened. The the day after Thanksgiving, when Black Friday hit, and two a.m., we had like eighteen orders. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is the worst. We're, we're we've gone bust before we even got started. And so I went to bed. Adam was still in Asia at the time, and he was asking. I said, "Don't worry, we'll, we'll check it in the morning." And so um, woke up the next morning, and and that dog had started to run. It was, it was great. We ended up selling out by 11 AM that morning over, over 25,000 pieces. What a relief. Extreme relief. <laughs> but, but the, the rest of that thing that, that isn't, uh, and the, and other entrepreneurs listening will, will appreciate this. Um, so when you ship stuff from Asia and obviously the Kirklands know this very well, you want to maximize your container space. So that's the, the shippable box that all of our goods that come from overseas comes in. Well, the order that they gave me was not the full max amount to, to fill it up. And so it was like 32,000 hammocks can fit in a 40 foot long container. We went ahead and filled it up with 32,000 hammocks because my feeling was, well, if we're going to go bust, I'd rather go bust with, you know, some ammo in the, in the, in the tank versus not. Well, when we sold out at 11, that guy calls back and says, tell me you have more. And I, and, um, which we did, I said, yeah, we've got more. Well, great. I'm going to turn the sale back on. This is doing great. I said, well, hold on. I said, those don't cost the same as the ones you got earlier. <laughs> and, and so we ended up leveraging those, um, roughly 7,500 units to cover the, the loan shark financing we got out of Hong Kong for the whole deal for, to cover the, the basis. So it was, uh, it was um, a calculated risk, I would say. Now, what um, did you have to debate at all about uh, where you wanted to sell your product? Because I know, like QVC and Walmart, and you know, mm -hmm. they're the same way. They really push, you know, the suppliers' price yes. down. So a lot of them don't even hardly make a lot of money. Um, you know, what 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 thought process went into that? That's a good question. So at the time, and especially in the, the mid 2000s, um, our retail space, it, it was very dominated by private label or white label goods. You see that everywhere now. Um, but at the time, you know, we really didn't know what the where the brand would be going or that overnight we would have a brand per se. Um, however, um, we had a good relationship and, and, and in those days, Amazon was, was not the, the zero sum end game that they are today. So what they did was they kept going back, going back to the, to the lever and trying to hit other big deals over the next 18 months with the same thing. And we saw really fast, Hey, look, we have a brand, but if we continue this race to bot to the bottom, we're not, there's going to be nothing left. Uh, but our mindset from all those years in Asia was building other product for another retailer versus like having your own standalone brand. So after a few years, we had to make the hard decision is, is to, to, to walk away from that business because it was going to, it was going to ruin us and then start to, to support uh, local retail mom and pop um, independence with the brand. Um, and, and it was tough. I mean, there was times where we, we, you know, we, we did this wonderfully large thing and, you know, the Walmarts called and they wanted the same deal. And, and it, when you get to certain numbers that you're just, you're just, um, compounding the, the pain versus, you know, a true growth. So what's your, you know, what's your product line, um, now like compared to what it was back then? 
So back then we were very focused on uh, the hiking experience. So ultralight product uh, gear that would you could use for several days, long weekend is a minimum. And but the market has shifted with outdoor products. It's uh, folks do not um, the segment of the population and the consumer population that actually buys product to spend outdoors for a long period of time is very small now compared to what it was 15, 10 years ago. Now we're, we're less the ultralight hammock, ultralight bags, real technical gear and more faced on or more focused on products for the family, uh, family recreation. So that's that can be everything from as simple as a, a cookout on the weekend. So you need drinkware and tumblers and things of that nature. Um, products for mom and dad to go back and forth to work with our bags and cases. Um, we're outdoorsmen, uh, you know, just from growing up. So we have some products for uh, for hunters and, 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 and folks that enjoy those shooting sports. But we don't go terribly deep. We let other brands kind of work on the little truly focused niches. Uh, we try to, um, you know, you know, keep our place or, or cement our places. You know, I've been called a, a Goldilocks brand because we're not, we're not an entry level. It's not super technical. It's right in the middle. So today, you know, whereas hammocks ruled the roost when we started and, and that real ultralight stuff today, we're it's drinkware, it's tumblers, it's coolers, hard and soft coolers. It's more everyday use weekend vacation items. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, I'm going to ask you how you ended up of all the cities in, in all the world, how you ended up in, uh, in, in the neighborhood close to me. Absolutely. The West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, Tennessee at exit 56 off I-40 offers an authentic Southern experience showcasing the history and culture of rural West Tennessee. Inside, visitors can learn about the history of cotton, explore the scenic and wild Hatchie River, and get to know the legendary musicians who call West Tennessee home. Also located on the grounds is Flag Grove School, the childhood school of Tina Turner and the last home of blues pioneer Sleepy John Estes. To learn more about the center, visit westtnheritage.com. Hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, my special guest today is Preston Powell. We're talking about um, how he started his business, Yukon Outfitters. Um, I actually have a couple of products um, here in my office. So my question is, so so during much of this time, you're working out of North Carolina, I assume? That's correct. Okay. And then uh, you decide you need to leave and find someplace else to uh, work out of. How do you end up in Alamo, Tennessee? <laughs> So when we, you know, North Carolina moved back there and from there, um, and then when the brand started taking off, we we put up a, an office and then a small warehouse. And um, but being the fact that you know both myself and Adam, we we cut our teeth in this business in a factory. Um, it's hard to get that factory rat mentality out of your head. So. Being back in the States, I started noticing some inefficiencies in the market with accessories and the uh, fitness uh, with headbands and um, uh, light apparel and accessories and said, well, that's a real simple sewing assembly. Why can't we do that here? And so like a lot of West Tennessee, uh, Central North Carolina has a, a tremendous amount of deep heritage in textile manufacturing. And so it was it was easy to find the the building and the machines but it was hard to find the people and soon our order book exceeded our capacity and so i was at a um a trade show for our industry and was talking to a friend of mine who at the who at the time was with new balance and you know they were they made shoes and still today have a few styles they make here and he said i heard you hit your head and you want to expand manufacturing in the u.s and I was like, yeah, that, that's right. He's like, well, I don't know why you would want to do that, but um, I have a friend in the business who is getting out and he's in Tennessee. And I, thought, I said, well, that's wonderful. That's one state over. Uh, can I have his contact information? And 
and I'd, lo- I'd love to see the facility. And so, you know, I call him up that day. He answers and he says, yeah, you, you, I'm, I'm here. And so I plug, I plug Alamo in my GPS and it's about nine and a half hours away from where I was in North Carolina. And I said, well, I already promised this fellow I'd be there. Let me go see it. And mind you, this is spring 2013. So this was before the whole, you know, let's make stuff here again. Um, the, all that push. It was, this is very foreign thought process in terms of manufacturing. And I get to Alamo, notice it's a similar community to, to, to Summerfield, North Carolina, where I grew up. And, and it just, it felt right and get in there. And I saw something that is super rare at then in this country. And then today it's, it's American skilled sewing labor. And, and, um, and it was the old little King uh, manufacturing plant that made, um, sports apparel for children. And they had been there since, you know, the late 1960s. And um, so we got talking and I saw and saw some vision and noticed that, you know, my thought of running the headbands and kind of fitness equip uh, accessory and then even some hammocks would work with a lot of the same machinery they had. And so being um, politely Southern, I put in an offer and then got back in the road and, and thought, well, one that I thought was low enough that was still respectable to, to justify the visit, but that he would tell me no. And they called and accepted the offer before I got to Nashville. And wow. So, so you know, did you have to then break it to your mom? Well, so that's the funny thing. So, you know, again, hearkening back to that experience in Asia, I thought we thought that we could run it from North Carolina the same way. Oh, a lot of the factory bosses run, you know, the China facility from Taiwan or Hong Kong. And I said, oh, we'll just go there, you know, once a month and everything will be fine. But we learned really quick that that was not that's not possible in the U.S. Um, and I think that's because of, of the there's an extreme level of communication on a job that is unique to America, whereas in Asia, it's um, it's it's different. So we learned. And so I came back to the North Carolina one day after a trip out to Alamo and I said, um, here, here, everyone, we're moving, we're packing up, we're going to move to West Tennessee. I'll pay for your moving. Uh, but that's where your job is. And, um, and I think uh, it took a few years, but mom just thought it was, uh, uh, just another wild venture or something. I didn't think she, she didn't think it was real till, till we started, uh, you know, growing a family here. <laughs> so it was, uh, and it's hard to believe that was, you know, eight and a half, nine years ago. Wow. Okay, great. And so your who all does your family consist of now? So my fam- um, my, my wife, um, Alexandra Lauren or Lexi, as she known by, uh, she and I, she's from Montana. We actually met in Hong Kong and, um, and, and got married. So I moved her from Hong Kong to Alamo, Tennessee. And uh, for the first year of our marriage, and then we have a, a four-year-old son, Hudson. Oh, congratulations. Yes, thank you. So um, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about uh, business and life in a rural community in a minute. But first, for people who don't know, Alamo uh, is in Crockett County. So you can uh, deduce the connection to Tennessee's David Crockett. That's right. Uh, it's a small rural community. How many people uh, live in Alamo now? Do you I, know? I believe in, in Alamo, in the town of Alamo, it's around 8,000 people now. Yeah, it's pretty. Um, it's really small. It is. Um, it's ironic that it was founded. I looked this up since I knew I was going to be talking to you. It was founded as a trading post mm-hmm. called Cageville by two men who were partners, Isaac Johnson and Lycurgus Cage. So uh, it was in 1846. So there you go. You're continuing the tradition of uh, of uh, merchandise. Yes. It, 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 and the story I heard from a few old timers after being in the community was because um, there's a lot of great oral history. I, I, and again, you know, I went to school to be a history teacher, so I enjoy local history. But um, the last settlement, if you will, Davy Crockett did his trading in, in out what is now known as present day Alamo. And so when he would travel to the state legislature in Jackson at the time, he would pass through that area. So one of the last places where, you know, when he lost the election and and made his famous quote, you know, you guys can all go to hell. I'm going to Texas. And everybody was like, well, don't let the barn door hit you on the way out. (laughs) It wasn't until the the efforts and the news of what he did with his, you know, group of Tennessee volunteers when they moved to Texas 
that then they're like, well, hey, he was last here. We're going to name this town Alamo and the county Crockett. So I don't know if 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 all of that is exactly true, but um, I enjoyed the the history on that. Yeah, I think that everything you said is uh, absolutely true. So that was good. Yeah. Um, good history lesson for our listeners out <laughs> there. Um, so so what is it? what has it been like to move from such an urban uh, community to doing business in a rural community? Uh, for me, it was it was very re- refreshing um, to it was the right time for Lexi and I to leave Hong Kong. Um, we kind of saw the writing on the wall with with they were you know mainland China was pulling it more into some of their um, political goals and um, but the the biggest uh, th- I would say that the biggest unique change in the beginning was we were definitely viewed as outsiders and 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 letting the local community and, and and the folks that that get things done know that we come in peace. We're not here to be disruptive. We're not here to, you know, um, we're here to, to, to put, you know, fellow uh, West Tennesseans to work and, 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 and take a, an economically disadvantaged uh, area um, and, and, and do something with it. So that um, kind of bootstrap level of commitment, um, I think was very well um, was very well received once once our true intentions you know were made because as as you see anywhere anytime outsiders come into a new community you you know people can be um, you know the, it, it might give them pause like what's going on how you know are we but in and we didn't um, and, and we told that to the to the workers who of the facility we acquired is like look you know. We know it's been tough, but we feel like we have the the some experience to keep this facility not just running twelve months a year, but but to grow. And um, so, I, I would say the biggest thing is is being understanding of of community values, and you can't um, just be incredibly pragmatic or ends justifies the means like you can in a big city of, of Hong Kong. You, you've got to you, your leadership needs to to change and, and, and recognize that because, um, you know, making the product is easy, but you you can't do it without, without the people being behind you. And, and just like everybody else who's in leadership, uh, the last few years, you obviously had to pivot as became mm. the buzzword for all of us. How did you tackle, uh, COVID? Well, COVID, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, you know, we were watching, and I say we, Adam and I, having lived over there, we we said something's happening because we were talking with friends and they were just, it was, you can tell what's not being said a lot about what's happening in China. And, and obviously it, it, you know, we find ourselves in mid March and our customers call and they, they tell us to pause every order we have. And so the factory's making um, our backpacks for LL Bean, our hammocks for a host of different retailers around the country, and all of them say stop. And you've got to be careful because a lot of people would run out to the production floor and say, hey, y'all shut it down, everybody going home, We're, we got to figure it out. But I was like, look, let them finish this run, let's figure it out. And then we had an idea, I was like, well, face masks are, are a thing, we should make face masks. And then but in our leadership group and is a company like, well, uh, well, they'll just get them out of China. And I was like, well, not if China's open, they're not like this is going to this is this is our moment. This is a chance. We're making stuff here. This is going to matter. So we went and I looked at I found a white paper that the CDC had issued back in 2002 about the pros and cons of cotton face masks in response to SARS. And and it was a just a um, a peer uh, peer reviewed you know paper back then. I said, well, okay, well, cotton is where we want to stick. And it just so happened that when we bought the factory, it came with seventy thousand yards of American made cotton in all these different university and team colors that I refused to let anybody throw away. And they call me the hoarder, but I, I I like to believe I'm just I'm just waiting for the right opportunity. I want to be prepared, and so 
it, a light bulb switch flipped in my head. And I said, uh, we're going to use all of this cotton back here. We're going to turn it into face masks. And, and we were fortunate. We were, we were one of the first um, sewing factories on in, you know, to get, to get that out, to get the word out uh, quickly. And, um, but we also were not so big that we were acquired by the federal government to only make for them. So it really, and a lot of people don't realize this in those, in that time, the, your big sewing plants were basically commandeered and then given, you know, material from FEMA and stuff and to make for them at the contract rate. Well, we were able to, because we were, you know, we were strong, but we were not that big. So we were able to, to, to miss that cut and be able to, um, to make those. So it was, it was very, it was just the being in the right place, you know, a, a classic example of, you know, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And we had the, the trim and materials, the elastic, all of that stuff on hand. And we were happy um, to keep our, all of our people employed and, 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 and also we didn't, we didn't, we resisted the ability to, to charge market rates for face masks and that, and that stuff at that time. And a lot of shops were not doing that. They were, they were making a fortune off of, off of this chaos, but we kept our price fair the same way the whole time. And um, we ended up turning, you know, that our little factory ended up making over a million face masks in uh, 2020. Wow, that's a great story. I know uh, the price of hand gel kept going up and up and yes. up because that's what we were trying to trying to buy. Um, so um, when you look ahead five years from now, um, what are, what are your longer term plans for the company? Five years from now, um, we feel really good about the move to West Tennessee because. This area is now starting to get uh, a lot of attention from uh, a lot of major players in industry. The Blue and Oval City announcement put, yes. put us on the map. Yes, put us on the map, and, and that has has created a lot of other you know companies and firms. Um, and then so you have that economic piece, but you also have folks that want to work from home or can work from home that want to live in a place where – you know, they're going to be free to, to, to live their lives how they want. Um, you know, um, and again, that's another thing. Going back to the whole pandemic thing, I can't stress enough about how the leadership from our state government was was critical because they didn't get in our way as a business to, hey, you've got to shut down. You know, it's like, hey, be, be clean, be, you know, do the basic stuff we all learned a long time ago about hygiene, but we're not going to get in your way. And that was, that was really important. Um, but it's interesting because you hear more people moving in the area and then, and it, and we kind of all realize, well, Hey, I, well, I guess we're Tennesseans now too, cause we've been here a minute and we came a while ago and, and it's um, so that's a, that bet, that's a bet that is continuing to pay off. Um, we're we're working hard and a lot of our opportunities that come in, in promoting the brand is because we warehouse and ship out of West Tennessee. So we have our facility in Alamo where we or we uh, ship out of. We have a another um, warehouse in Jackson, and that allows us to leverage the, our unique position in the country to if it needs to be at a store in Billings, Montana, I can be there in three days if it. Uh, we have uh, very fast access to, to Texas and the Florida economies, which are on fire right now. Um, so we're we're going to continue our growth uh, here. Um, a lot of the 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 manufacturing piece is going to be we're using technology in our space to offer cu rapid customization, so that um, you know labor is hard for everyone right now, especially a place that where you're sewing things. So any things that we can use to achieve a, a mechanized advantage in our, in our, you know, product options, those are, those are ways that we're, we're doing that. Um, so the uh, mission of discovery park of America is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. So for our listeners out there, what are the sources of inspiration that, that you recommend to young entrepreneurs? Um, ask questions. Um, look to other entrepreneurs in your community and they do not have to be 
those who may have a national brand or do something. It can be your local um, air conditioning company, your your local pest control company. All of those individuals deal with the same challenges every day. And the biggest challenge is taking care of your people and then taking care of yourself. Um, or I should say your people, your customers, and yourself is, is probably how that arc would be. And, uh, and don't be afraid to learn. You know, we're conditioned right now through just culture and media that you want it tomorrow or right now. But experience takes time. Perspective takes time. And putting yourself in a position to learn from others is, is critical because um, it allows you to avoid what might be costly mistakes down the road. So that, that learning period um, is very important, you know, we're probably close to the same age. You know, we were coming up through school. It was hammered. You got to get an MBA. You got to get that in order to to get that better job down the line. I would argue today that 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 real world experience in that in that lane or career that you care about is more important than another um, graduate degree, especially in business. So that level of experience um, is important. And then also, don't be afraid to take a chance. Um, you know, calculated risk is what built this country, um, especially this state. And, um, you know, I love we have a lot of customers in the state of Texas and I love uh, um, we do a lot of business there and, and they're very proud. You won't find another state with more pride than Texas. But I love reminding them that is without the state of Tennessee, there would be no state of Texas. <laughs> That's right. They probably love your uh, the town you're from, Crockett <laughs> County. Yeah. So. <laughs> You got to be willing to take a risk and and just um, and I'm not talking about crypto and and all the the you know retail investing and 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 that I'm sure there's a place for that that those that that are passionate about that I'm just talking about everyday business because you know you you have to be be willing to navigate risk and and we're entering a new stage of this new economy where we don't know we had a severe drop during COVID. A massive upswing, but now there's a host of challenges with uh, inflation, with um, your your supply chain, and that that is everything from our cups and, and raw materials that we need from abroad all the way down to your grocery store shelf. So, how we navigate this, um, I feel like there's going to be a lot of opportunity in that chaos. Hey, on that note, we're going to end. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. I've always wondered what you guys were doing over there, so it was fun to to learn firsthand. Absolutely. Well, you, you're more than welcome to stop by anytime. We'll give you the nickel tour, and uh, we just appreciate you and you all getting the word out on entrepreneurship here in West Tennessee. Excellent. I'm going to do that. Thank you to all you listeners who joined Preston, Emily, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. <laughs>